Hey there guys, so today we're going to be taking a look at a comparison of the ROG Ally versus a mini PC, specifically the UM780 XTX. The reason we're comparing these two systems is because they're actually a lot more similar than you would expect them to be at first glance. See, the ROG Ally is powered by the AMD Z1 Extreme processor, which is an 8-core, 16-thread, Zen 4-based APU with 12 RDNA 3 graphics cores. This is strikingly similar to the 7840HS that's in this mini PC with its 8 cores and 16 threads based off of Zen 4 and also has 12 graphics cores. The key difference between the two systems is really just going to come down to the TDP differences. We're going to be running the ROG Ally at a TDP of 30 watts, which is just the performance of it plugged into the wall, but really the performance at 30 watts is practically identical to 25 watts. While the UM780 XTX here is going to have a TDP of about 70 watts. This is pretty much more than double what we have on the ROG Ally, and we'll see what kind of difference that actually makes in our overall performance. Really more than anything, I'm just curious to see what we're looking at in terms of uplift from having a consistent power delivery that can actually cool these chips at a higher TDP. Essentially, how much performance are we losing on the ROG Ally by going with this form factor? So let's jump right on into some game testing. So the first game we're going to be taking a look at is Dying Light, but I do need to mention one thing, and it's the fact that I'm pretty much just recording the screen of the actual device because for some reason my ROG Ally is refusing to disable the HDCP protection. In the AMD driver, I am actually hitting the disable button and it is disabled, but for some reason it's not actually taking effect. So this is pretty much how I had to record the ROG Ally and for the mini PC, I was actually able to capture the footage properly. But in terms of the overall performance in Dying Light 2 running with the lowest in-game settings and using FSR 2.0 with the performance preset, we actually do see some relatively impressive numbers on both systems considering that this is a triple a title that is relatively recent but those one percent lows are pretty disappointing on both systems but we do actually see a 17.3 percent increase in performance on both the fps average and one percent lows going from the rog ally to the full desktop with the 70 or rather 60 watt tdp it tends to fluctuate depending on the game some games will go to 70 others will go to 60 only so there's definitely a noticeable increase here though it isn't going to be something that is earth shattering by any means Another frequent flyer on this channel is Tiny Tina's Wonderland, and this is running with the medium settings, and we are using FSR, but at the quality preset. And here we see a pretty minor 12% increase in the FPS average, which isn't really that substantial, considering that our FPS average of 58 on the ROG Ally is more than adequate enough, and going up to 65 isn't going to make a drastic difference in your overall experience. But what is going to make a drastic difference is that 157% increase in those one percent lows that's right we go from one percent lows that are in the low 20s all the way up into the 50s this is really impressive uplifts and this seems to be the trend that i saw the most between these two where the higher tdp and better overall cooling of the mini pc actually doesn't give us a big uplift in the fps average as much as it tends to improve those one percent lows these massive gains aren't universal though and it really seems to depend on on whether or not the title that you're playing is going to be very CPU dependent or not. Here with Rainbow Six Siege running with the very high graphics settings with FSR 2.0 at the quality preset or rather the ultra quality preset, the performance that we get on both systems is pretty adequate and in general you're not going to be disappointed with either one though there is a pretty consistent increase in performance on both the FPS average and 1% lows. But since this is a CPU demanding title that doesn't really use multiple cores, it's no surprise that the Z1 Extreme would perform very similarly to the 7840HS. Next, I took a look at, at Mountain Blade 2 Banner Lord running with the medium in-game graphics settings. And of course, this one ended up being pretty surprising to me in the sense that we saw a pretty damn low increase in that FPS average with the lowest increase that we've seen of only 8%. Though the 1% lows see a relatively standard 14.7% increase in the 1% lows. Not Earth 
earth-shattering performance gains by any means, and really the experience is actually great on either system, so not really much to complain about here. And also we don't really see that big of an uplift, but even in the worst case scenarios, we are still seeing an uplift. Of course, one of the most demanding games on the market right now is Returnal, and here running with the lowest in-game graphics settings and using FSR with the performance preset, neither system is really giving a great result. Though we do technically see an 18.5% increase in the FPS average, but the real showstopper here is the 433% increase in those 1% lows. So all that really accomplishes is that the 1% lows finally make it into the double digit territory, and that's pretty much where it loses all steam. This is an extremely demanding title that even for these mini PCs ends up being pretty heavy. So it's no surprise that a TDP limited mini PC, which is just what these handhelds are, is going to end up falling apart in a title like this. And it really exactly the thing that I'm talking about where the biggest uplift that I end up seeing in a lot of these titles actually ends up being in those 1% lows way more than the FPS averages. This really isn't all that surprising considering that the hardware between the two systems is so similar. Really the key differences are just missing AI engines from the Z1 Extreme and really just the fact that on these desktops you're able to just set the TDP to something significantly higher than what these handhelds are really designed to do. But I think people put a lot of of emphasis on the plugging in the ROG Ally aspect since you can go from 25 watts max up to 30, but that 5 watt difference really doesn't make much of a difference at all in gaming. It's just not substantial enough to really start to make much of a difference at all. And with the ROG Ally, it is just extremely hot as a system anyway. So that 30 watt TDP does end up becoming a problem because it will just make the system significantly louder for very little gain. Of course, there are other key differences between the two and fundamentally they do serve different market segments but because of the fact that these handhelds are just pcs there's really nothing stopping you from just using this as a mini pc and while you are sacrificing some performance it's still going to be really decent in a lot of the titles that you would realistically end up playing in these kinds of systems anyway it's not like going with the mini pc is suddenly going to make it so that you can play some of the latest AAA titles that just won't run at all on the Z1 Extreme. You're really looking at an average of about 15% increase in both the FPS average as well as those 1% lows. The 1% lows is where you are more likely to see these massive increases because unfortunately the lower TDP limit of the Z1 Extreme can actually be a problem in certain titles just depending on what exactly they're trying to do. And this of course is if you're just using the higher TDP modes, you can't always set the ROG Ally to to 15 watts or even 10 watts, but good luck playing anything outside of Stardew Valley with that. I did do more testing of a bunch of different titles on here, but unfortunately, most games don't really have built-in benchmarks and it's harder to do side-by-side -side comparisons because of the lack of repeatability in a lot of these things. But of the 20 or so games that I ended up testing in general, I didn't really find any that I thought were egregious enough to really mention. I was kind of just testing a bunch of games and I wanted to see if there was anything that I could try out that would be a disaster on the Z1 or just barely at the edge of playability and the desktop could really push it over that. And realistically, while playing on either system, I just didn't find anything that really had that major of a jump outside of the few that I showed you here that saw these crazy increases in those 1% lows. But those are the most extreme scenarios. But in general, if a title ends up having about a 10% FPS average increase, it seems like the 1% lows will lean more towards 15. So while they're nice uplifts, it's not really something where it would deter me from going with a handheld because I'd feel like I was losing out on some performance. The form factor itself is kind of a selling point, and I think sacrificing 10-15% in the vast majority of titles is actually not a bad trade-off at all for having a system like this that you can take with you anywhere. Really, the biggest thing that the mini PC has over the ROG Ally and practically every handheld on the market is just just the fact that you get way more expandability on a mini PC. See, on this ROG Ally, if I want to expand on the very tiny 512 gigabytes of storage, I'd have to open this up and put in a tiny 2 terabyte SSD in here, which is what that form factor caps out on, or I could put in a 1 terabyte SD card that has no guarantee of even surviving considering that these ROG Allies tend to have it failing 
read ports for their memory cards that seem to finally get addressed by Asus, but who knows what the actual fix process is going to be if you run into the issue. Knowing their history, I really wouldn't want to take that risk if I were you, so I would just, if you're getting an RG Ally, assume that that SD port is just not going to work anymore. So we're left with expanding on just these tiny M.2s that are very expensive for what they are, really. While on a mini PC like this, well, I just have two full-size M.2 slots that I can slot any SSD that I want in there. Now, technically, the theoretical limit of a system like this is, as of right now, about 16 terabytes since you can put two 8 terabyte drives in there. Now, why would you put 8 terabyte SSDs in a mini PC this cheap? I will never understand, but I mean, if the storage is what matters the most and the hardware here gets the job done, then I really can't say anything. I think that the thing that impressed me the most is that at the 30 watt TDP, the Z1 Extreme is close enough to the desktop mini PC that I don't think that people are really going to end up worrying too much about a loss of performance. But as some of those titles showed, there is going to be some key differences in certain titles just because you see a pretty major improvement in those 1% lows. But some of those titles, whether or not they have that 1% low increase doesn't really matter because it doesn't bring it to a playable range anyway. So it doesn't fundamentally mean anything. These two form factors right now are the big drivers of innovation right now in the PC industry, and they're both seeing tremendous amounts of growth. So it's interesting to see that right now the performance between the two form factors really isn't all that different. Of course, Steam Deck not included in this since the Steam Deck is such a custom chip in comparison to this. But it does show that the 780M does have some nice flexibility where it can go onto a desktop that uses noticeably more power than any kind kind of laptop or handheld without a dedicated graphics would realistically end up using. And the 7080M is still able to keep up for the most part at these lower TDPs. So if you're interested in taking a look at either of these system and picking one of them up, check out the Amazon links down below. I'll catch you guys in the next one.